Aloha no ka ko. My name is Kioni Kealoha Alvarez. I'm the great great grandson of Joseph Kahikolo and Kealoha Lapaku Kaui. My home is located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, thousands of miles away from any country or continent of this world. Over 2,000 years ago, my ancestors discovered these islands and named it Hawaii. I'm not a chant writer, nor a chanter, but I thought to myself, what would I sound like expressing my feelings in the Hawaiian language of what our ancestors are going through? And it sounded like this. Elohe i kaleo oko kako mauku kuna i ka i leva ye kamakani lilo i ka po he kui he kili he o lapa kawila e keau e uwe kalani uwo ke kai e lua i pele e o pa i pa i kahonua no na kupuna o hava ine it's been 10 long years since I returned to this place. It is a secret that I held for so long. Culturally, this place is Kapu, sacred. I'm just creating this trail just so I can, you know, get back to this place. So we're kind of heading more towards that direction. I live in the Puna district, which is the rural part of our island. Raised here, our lifestyle was simple, hunting, fishing, and surfing. My family wasn't the traditional Hawaiian family, speaking the Hawaiian language, dancing the hula, or practicing the Hawaiian beliefs. And this is because parts of our Hawaiian culture was not passed down to my family. This is my mother, and she's my pohaku, or rock. She shared with me the little values passed down from her grandparents. When I watch her, I kind of see the tradition of our past unfold before me. and put it on each other. We're gonna make lao laos, okay? I have five sons, and Keone is the youngest of the five. He was a very good child. He loves animals of all kinds. He always found things to do. Out of all my children, he was the most creative. I feel closely connected to this sacred place surrounded by nature and the history of my ancestors. Our people were spiritual people and had respect for everything they believed in. From the tips of the mountains to the depths of the ocean, we are connected. When I was eight years old, my brothers discovered a cave in the forest near our home. They did not know what was within the cave so as kids, they went into it to play. They realized that there was something in there. They discovered human skeletal remains. 
My mom called the police to report what they found. Archaeologists positively identified the remains as ancient Hawaiians. I grew up taking care of this burial cave and took it upon myself as my responsibility. I kept it safe from being desecrated. As kids, at first, we were scared of the burial site. Uh, Keone took it a notch further and he realized that when we were older that it's not something to be scared about, it's something to take care of and watch over it. My name is Keone Alvarez. We have a resolution before us, 244-06. Do you agree with the resolution, or should it be amended in some way, do you think? I'm in support for 224, and I think everybody can reach a common goal on that. And the resolution is supporting the efforts to protect Native Hawaiian ancestral remains, um, funerary objects, and the desecration and destruction of burial sites. I always thought that there were United States laws that protect Hawaiian rights as indigenous peoples of the land. Years later, I found out our reporting of the burial site was lost due to poor record keeping by the government. Today, when I hear bulldozers nearby, I remember the screeching sounds of the wheels turning. It was like a ticking time clock letting me know that I must hurry up to protect the burial cave because I don't have very much time. With development booming on the Big Island, the Puna District is primed for progress, but some Native Hawaiians say it's running roughshod over ancestral remains. If we knew that it wasn't flagged, you know, it would have given us enough time to preserve this site. The story of a young man trying to protect an ancient burial site next to his Big Island home. He's guarding something more valuable than treasure, more precious than gold. And construction everywhere. Hawaiians fear every time a lot is cleared, another burial cave is destroyed. When they started to bulldoze our forest, they started to hit sensitive areas to our Hawaiian people, meaning that it's cultural sites and especially our burial sites. I decided to do some research on my own, hoping to find a solution to protect the cave. Online, there are many articles and cases of Hawaiian burials being desecrated in Hawaii. Seeing some of the outcomes of what could happen was really disturbing. There is a law in the Hawaii state statutes which protects prehistoric and Hawaiian burials. Under this law, burial councils are set up on each major island. I remember the first time I had a meeting with the burial council. Yes, this is me. To be seated in front of this burial council, I felt intimidated because they have the power to recognize descendants, to keep burials in place, or to remove burials from their locations. At my first burial council meeting, I was denied cultural descendancy. So I took the council's advice to do more research about my genealogy. My mother took out the time to explain our family genealogy with me. Of all our family, she knew the most. It was a total, I think, of 26 children altogether, but we're considered the second half of the Kahikola family. Our genealogy goes back seven generations to the Hawaiian Kingdom time period. The old photos of my great-great-grandparents took me back in time as my mother told their stories. I could see it in her eyes, how she missed her grandparents. I wanted to learn more about Hawaiian burial sites, so I went to the library to do some research. Let me show you a couple of books in this section here. Okay. Um, David Malo and Samuel Kamakawa were two well-known Hawaiian scholars. This is David Malo's book, wow. Hawaiian Antiquities. Okay. It's pretty good. He writes about a, a lot of different Hawaiian traditions, including burial. Burials were sacred. Burials were important. When a person dies, their corpse remains. 
but their spirit takes another turn. Hawaiian burial traditions are never the same. The ceremony depends on the family practices, status, local surroundings, and even the circumstances of how a person died. The women would help in the burial process. They would gather natural herbs and prepare needed supplies that the men would need to bury the body. Women would make kapa, a material made of mamaki, also known as the mulberry tree. The bark of the tree was skillfully pounded into a strong fiber cloth and oftentimes used to wrap the deceased body or bones before burial. Only a few chosen kane or men prepared the body for the nighttime burial. During the burial preparation, men and women worked separately in different houses. Because Hawaiians were very thorough. They knew every bone in your body and every muscle and how it linked. They didn't know that by just putting it on the side, they went through it. Hawaiians used several different burial methods. If the ground was dirt, a pit was dug. But if the ground was solid rock, stones were stacked over the body. Some burials were in lava tubes and in caves or in sand dunes near the ocean. In the library, it is very difficult to find information about Hawaiian burials and practices. It was no surprise to me that the subject was kapu, not to be published or a subject to be studied or written about. I found a book which was promising to me. It was written in the 1800s called the Ku E Petition, which documented Hawaiians who were against the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. This book held over 22,000 signatures, which included the locations they lived in at the time. And soon enough, I found my great-great-grandparents' signatures. It was the Kaui lineage. It identified their location of residence. To my amazement, they lived in my district. Then I wondered that maybe the burials in the cave could be my direct relatives. I visited a small old Hawaiian cemetery on the island of Oahu called the Queen Liliu Okalani Protestant Church. When my mom was a little girl, her grandmother told her this is where her Kaui family line is buried. This whole graveyard looks so different. It wasn't like this at all. Every time my grandma would go to funerals of our family, I was always the one that was taken along. So I wasn't in fear of burials or death or anything. I took Keone to where his great, 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 great grandparents were all buried. My mom found our relatives. It's her grandmother's sister, Mary, and her brother, David Kahihikolo. These headstones did not just refer to them by name, but it has their photo. In an album, I found a young picture of my great-grandmother, and this is her sister Mary's photo on the headstone. It was very interesting for him to learn uh, where he's from, who our family heritage is, and to just be respectful, not only of our Ohana's grave, but anybody else's grave. You don't step on somebody's grave. You go around it, you know, as respect for the individual. I really believe that when they lawnmowered and they grew grass, they grew it right over our families. Hey, Gilliam, Gilliam. Isn't the Gilliam family our family? Lapaku Kauhi, here. This is our lineage because that's our great great grandmother's, our great grandmother's name is Lapaku Kauhi. And then the next generation over is another Lapaku Kauhi. And then our great grandfather's is also Lapaku Kauhi. It's awesome to see that we still have our tombstones still here, Lapaku Kaui, and then he was born in 
December 20th, 1863, and he died on May 29th, uh, 1931. So, so it's very important that we have these kind of sites still, still around. For over 2,000 years, there was a common way Hawaiians have practiced to bury our people. The method they used was to arrange them in a fetal position for its burial. Hawaiians prepared the body by tying a rope to the knee joints and pulling it around the neck until the knees touched the chest. The rounded body was tightly wrapped in kapa cloth and a round hole was dug to kanu the body or planted. Like a tree, the body was planted in the earth to be reborn to the spirit world of Kane. People today is just developing everywhere. The subdivision I'm at, people are starting to bulldoze and getting closer and closer to our burial cave. And this worries me, it worries me a lot to know that people can go ahead and sell cultural sites or even our burials and possibly even develop on it. I visited the first public graveyard in Hawaii. It was created in 1844 called the Oahu Cemetery. This site is 18 acres, which housed over 35,000 individual graves from around the world. Traditional Hawaiians did not have markers per se. And so it, it's been a trouble uh, problem finding traditional Hawaiian burial sites for us because there's no markers. But our mo'olelos tell us some stories about where to go and where somebody was buried. A lot of people tell me when they come to Oahu Cemetery that they notice that there's so many famous people here. And there are, there are hundreds of famous people here because a lot of people just associate them with being repositories for the dead. I call them outdoor museums and outdoor historic sites because they tell our history. That's to me one of the most important, if not the most important function of a graveyard. So this is a grave of Samuel Manaya Kalani Kamakau. He is among the top five Hawaiian historians in the history of Hawaii. He was important in his lifetime. He's important to all of us Hawaiians today because he has taught us in, in written form so it has been able to be passed on to future generations. So this guy is huge in Hawaiian culture. Why do we have cemeteries? Why do we have markers as human beings, no matter where you are in the world? Uh, what function does it serve us to have these places? And from country to country, culture to culture, it differs. But many commonalities is that we need basic to our core of who we are as human beings, we need to memorialize our ancestors. And who is this? This is Mariah Kahanamoku, was one of uh, eight siblings in the Kahanamoku clan, whose most famous Kahanamoku, of course, was our Duke Kahanamoku, who was a famous uh, surfer, canoe paddler. This is the only full-bodied, sculpted piece of a real person in any graveyard in Hawaii. So here's a more contemporary Hawaiian patriot. His name was Dr. Kekuni Blaisdell. So he was an important mentor for me and he always, um, he always encouraged me oh, to, uh, to do the work that I'm doing. Amazing, amazing. It's a very important person. Good, man person. good mentor here. Oh, and you, can, uh -huh. you can leave a whole kupu for our, for our, for our people, yeah. On the windward side of the island, surrounded by beautiful jagged mountains and valleys, this place is called Hawaiian Memorial Cemetery. My mom's grandmother, who adopted her and raised her as her own, lay in rest here. It was nice to be with my family, my mom, her sister, and little brother. We adorned her headstone with fresh flowers and reminisced about my great-grandmother's love for our family. It was a beautiful thing. It was not a custom for Hawaiians to mark their burial site locations. Though uncommon, sometimes an ahu or an altar 
of stone or wood was made near the burial site. Only the family would use this platform to place offerings on it. This is how we as Hawaiians do our offering. And it's not for anybody to open my offering and to see what's in it. You know, this is something personal to me. And this is my gift to my kupuna, to my ancestors who's buried in this cave. Nobody else. In the forest, we have many different types of plants. As indigenous people of the forest, it's a refuge, knowing that every living thing within it can be utilized. This plant right here is very special to our Hawaiian people. It is called the key plant. Every part of this plant was used in the Hawaiian culture. There's another way that Hawaiians use the key plant. And what they'll do with the root is they'll chop it up and they'll smash it. And out of the root, fluid would come out and they would actually use that as an embalming fluid when a person died. So whenever you see this plant, you're gonna see most likely it's planted around families' homes or you're gonna see it in culture sites and especially burial sites because part of its properties was to ward off evil. And that's the reason why a lot of people use this plant around their homes or in special areas that they want to protect. This forest that surrounds the cave is sacred. When I come here, it reminds me of a Hawaiian elder who shared with me an untold story of a burial method his family used in the forest. What my mama said, there is a couple who loved her so dearly. And it was a young girl. She took ill and she died and they love her so much. What they did is uh, prepare all these herbs and put it all different areas where they, they could drain all the liquid out here. Yeah? And uh, they kept her. When a person lived in the mountains passed away, their organs was also removed and their body was filled with pulu or the hairy part of the hapu ferns. This was another way Hawaiians buried their people. Some bodies were treated um, in a fashion called i'aloa, the long fish, where they would um, do an incision and remove as much of the body organs as can. And they would um, pack the, the cavity with pa'akai, with Hawaiian salt. Important part of the body, they wrap it up with salt and bandage it up. And the mouth, they put salt in the mouth and they close the mouth. Everything is prepared. That's why when they find the bodies, the body don't decay fast. It takes time because the salt is what preserves the body. I told my auntie, oh boy. So that, that was my lesson. To me, it was a lesson. My worst fears came true. A for sale sign was posted in front of the burial cave property. It was sold to a developer whose plans were to develop two homes on the burial cave property. You know, in Hawaii, there's a lot of places that's still undeveloped. There's a lot of forests. And a lot of times people are purchasing these properties because a lot of realtors today, they're not uh, disclosing the information to the people who's purchasing the properties. And then by the time we as descendants confront the people and let them know, it's already too late. You know, the place is destroyed. And this place has a lot of old forests and trees and you wouldn't know what's under here until you understand the history. I drove to a place to meet a Hawaiian elder named Sam Kaliliki, 
who was on the east side of our island. He wanted to show me a culturally sensitive place, which he knows it is for sale. All along this route here, you'll find signs like that say, couple, no trespassing, a Hawaiian burial site protected by law. But whenever we come up to a, a site that's preserved or it says couple, that's exactly what we do. We understand what couple means. It's sacred. And yet you have realtors who put their signs up. This is the kind of things that the Western culture do. The Westerners come here and they know this is sacred land. The problem for the people that's going to buy this land is they got to deal with the descendants. Every person, whether you were a great on the E or a kawa, a servant, a slave, you had sacred or rituals in which your, your bones or your body was prepared. As Hawaiians, um, we believe that our mana, our spiritual power that each and every one of us have is housed or contained within the ivi, within the bones. And so ivi is very, very sacred. Ivi is the bone structure of anything. Humans, it's a skeletal remain. The rest of your body is, is flesh, it has feelings, it has all of that. Your EV is your foundation. It's the basis on which you exist. In ancient times, they would place the body in an emu or in, in an underground oven so that the flesh would be easy to take off. The Pella of the body was burned in a pit of fire and turned into lehu, or ashes. In a special place, the kahuna would then pour the ashes into the ocean. The night was like a cloak. It was a protection for the burials and the people who were burying them. And the bones possessed the greatest of the mana. With great care, they would take this and wrap it in a pu'olo, a kapa, or an ie, a basket. And for a very important chiefs, the ka'ai was woven from the ia ia roots. They were decorated to look or represent the human being, including ears and mouths. Uh, other Hawaiians believe that, that they should be put into sand dunes. Advantage of putting them into sand dunes is that eventually they will rot down so that the bones become part of that sand. So the ocean and the things of land become one and the same within the sand dune. Unlike the ground where you can dig it up and you still have a sense of something being dug there. Sand dunes, you couldn't, you couldn't do that. They can cover up the sand dune very well. People would never know that you buried there last night. KHON2 News has learned that public sand was taken in large quantities from Dillingham Airfield in Mokulaia and the digging unearthed human remains in an old family burial ground. Many sand dunes have been documented as historical burial grounds. Today, it's been sold off and illegally mined for home development, golf courses, and to make high-rise concrete buildings in Hawaii. I met Clara Pana on Maui. She's a protector of sand dune burials where her ancestors lay. These burials are zoned and protected as a Hawaiian burial preserve. This is a place that has well always been dear to my heart because I was born here in the sand dunes of Wailuku Waikapu. The sand dunes as other sand dunes all throughout the isle islands of Hawaii our traditional places to bury our people. This is a place that they came to lay to rest. This particular pu'u is my ohana. I've been through acres and acres of sand dunes and this is where my ohana is. You may not drive on this road and through this gate, which is probably a good idea because I believe that our kupuna are all over this entire area, not just inside this fence. I know it's very sacred, you know, and um, it needs to be preserved. And for me, I like to see what a preserve looked like. And this is a, you know, a little step towards 
preservation of having a sign, having a fence. Yes. And I think it's awesome that um, the government or, or people are starting to realize that we need these preserves to protect our Ivi Kupuna and they are important. On the island of Kauai, I received news of a desecration of an old Hawaiian burial ground called Naue that was secretly being dug up. Shovels and excavators were used to dig trenches to set the cement foundation for a home to be built on. In the process, over 30 Hawaiian burials were discovered throughout the property. Descendants and islanders soon became aware of what was happening. Before the digging started at Naue, I interviewed Auntie Louise, a descendant of the burials. This is the front entrance to what I call Naivi or Naue Cemetery. And this is Joe Breshka's property. Normally, uh, we have a beach access here that we allow the people to walk through. Uh, during the weekdays, if no one's here at the camp, I keep it locked just to help me uh, maintain that no construction will start on this property. On the property, archaeologists identified 30 Hawaiian burials. Each burial location were marked with orange flags or wooden pegs. As you can see behind me, there are between 30 and 48 burials here. They're all numbered along with the depth of the burial. The archaeologists have said between the 10th and 13th century, making this cemetery at least 700 years old. Each of the stakes that you see have a number on them, and then they also have a body identification tag, which lists the body number and the depth it's at. So this is body number 28 at a depth of 50 inches. So this is one of the older burials. So Kupuna is buried under here in the sand area, and um, it's right you know, fronting the ocean. My understanding why Hawaiians bury their uh, deceased here is because it keeps the bones in the flesh. It has time to dry and keeps them intact. And like this one is 18 inches. So 18 inches deep. You dig down 18 inches and you'll, you'll be on the po'o of our kupuna. You know, kupuna is right here in this whole area. Aloha kupuna, kupuna, aloha, mahalo kupuna. This is the, this is it, you know. Um, all women and children here buried, and they want to dig it up, you know. You tell me, why can't you walk away from this? And I'm going to tell you, every time Joe Briska comes into this car, uh, this neighborhood. He brings security guards. Mm -hmm. Nobody else brought security guards over here. Why he make us feel like this? You tell me. This is not the first time I've been up against this man. He moved my kupuna to put a septic tank. He's trying to control our culture. And in the way of controlling our culture, he is ruining our graveyards. Cemetery, just like in your culture, burial sites is the same thing. Walk away from it. Namakua mai, kia palo wa Namakua mai, o ke akua mana loa. O oi kamana o io kamana o lana ame ke aloa paole malama o ia mako mahalo nui loa i ke iela e ho o po mai kai o i ke ia ivi na kupuna na keki i ke ia aina aloha e hie mahalo e hie aloha e hie So every evening at sunset, we light the fire at the campfire, and we also light all these torches. And each of these are actual burials. Each torch represents a burial site.
where there are human remains. To count, there's 42, and there may be more, we're not sure, but as you can see, this is a cemetery. This is a burial site. This is where they were placed. And this is where their remains are. They're actual people. Keiki and Vahine. Whew, that's plenty. You talk about Keone and Malama Ikaina, yeah, yeah, these yeah. burials. It's not about bringing it to anybody's attention. Yeah. It is already at our attention as Hawaiian people. What he has learned from his instilled in him, and that is respect for their place. The, those people that own the property, did they ever go down there? No. Um, no, they, no. For us as Native Hawaiians, I believe it should be our responsibility to make sure um, that this burial site is being protected, preserved. Well, so, as so you're going to keep it as natural as possible then? Yeah, natural as possible. Yeah. It's just a matter of just trying to protect it the best way we can. When I see these flags, it just brings back a lot of emotion, a lot of feeling of how I felt at that time um, of them surveying the property and also even going into the burial cave. So, you know, for me, this is a sacred place to me. You know, I had like a lot of mixed emotions about even letting people even in there, especially foreigners who care nothing about our culture, who know nothing about our culture, who's not even connected to it. That was the hard part for me. It was 15 years ago when this happened. I remember a conference call I had with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs Burial Council about the invasive cave survey that took place. So far, this is the lava tube that you found. How far does it extend off the proposed land? 200 to 300 feet in. I would say it's about maybe 20 feet high, maybe about 25 to 30 feet wide. And what I'm saying is that this kind of caves with our EV in it, I mean, it's for the future generations because, I mean, they're taking everything. They're not only taking the land, they're taking our EV too. So we will support the previous identified status. Okay. And then NHCC is recommending that staff and admin continue to assist you, which could be on, a, on multiple different levels, yeah? Mm -hmm. Could be financial, could be uh, letter writing, support, testimony, all kind of different things. Okay, okay. And that's regarding for capping the cave or whether it be just capping the cave or to even purchase it also could be in that in that same category, right? Uh, all those issues and more. Okay, okay. Okay, that sounds great. After numerous meetings with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, they have never provided me financial help to defend my rights nor have they assisted to purchase the historic property off the land market. It always ended up in the same result, nothing being accomplished. Hey, Keone Alvarez, this is Wendy Machado from Historic Preservation. You called earlier. I checked into our files about the cave. It's been really well documented with the county and DLNR above to the chair and, and with the barrel council members. And like I said, they dropped a the bulldozer. Call. Soon after that, the developer brought a bulldozer to move forward on breaking ground on the burial site. I was so upset by the landowner's actions. As I drove to the burial sites, the sounds of the bulldozer pushing ground grew louder and louder. When I arrived there, I noticed my mother had already confronted the bulldozer operator and the developer and told them to stop immediately. I then rushed into the forest. The only thing that ran through my mind was to make sure that our ancestors was protected and wasn't desecrated by this bulldozer. When I looked around, he did not want to listen to me. I even told the landowner. I always get choked up because, but I, t I just told him that 
if he lands that bulldozer on this property and call the cops and he's gonna get arrested for desecrating our burial. So it's so hard, you know, that people just don't understand what it means, what our kupunas mean to us, you know. And um, for me, I just know that once you bulldoze the site, two swipes on this little piece of property, it's gone and it's gone forever. I was shocked to see that one swipe of this bulldozer of the damage that it caused to the forest. He is the guardian over the Ivy Kupunas. You Hawaiian? No, no, we all, we all Hawaiian, but we don't need air. But you know what? Air, what? You gonna destroy? No, we're not gonna Kupuna destroy. Ivy? We're not gonna destroy nothing. I don't understand. What's I'm asking you? Are you Hawaiian? No. Okay, then you don't understand. I don't understand. You don't understand the culture. I don't. I don't. I don't. Hey, What's the problem? What are you guys are doing? You know, you guys destroyed this place. I bought that the land. I bought the land. I'm not trying to make a buck. Yeah. I got permits to build. I don't know about this. This uh. Well, you know what? what you Your there there is boundaries that you have to stay away and from. And we are going to the state. Yeah. Not yeah. me. Yeah. No. Your realtor was supposed to tell them. Tell you. So do you know the history about this area? This area has burials in it, and you're just going ahead with your bulldozer. Yeah, and you're just pushing this place. You know desecrating our barrels is a crime, right? This is a cultural thing. And if you don't understand that, you need to learn the culture of Hawaii and how our people feel about their kupuna I have no problems with that. I'm trying to tell you, I don't know what in the world about your, about your realtor, but they're supposed to know there is boundaries that you cannot overgo. You cannot overstep certain boundaries. Yeah, no. That whole place is boundaries. We're not going to touch the barrel site. We, I guarantee, look, I don't want to touch the doors up. I don't like no hard luck. I know what it is. I'm not touching them, I'm not going to close. As I looked at my mom, I knew something didn't settle right with her. So I decided to call the county police department to let them know what was going on on this historic property. I showed my documentation of the burial ground by the government. The land developer then halted his project. Caves were sacred and had the right conditions. Rainwater seeping through the lava made caves a pure and peaceful resting place. Burial caves are usually, the, the opening of the burial caves are usually very small and hard to get in. So once you get that burial in, their loved ones who has passed on will be safe in that particular place. Also, caves were a perfect hiding place to bury bones. For Hawaiians, it was not in their nature to be entering, venturing the depths of a cave, especially if they knew it was a burial cave. Hawaiians believe it to be a pathway to Milu, the underworld of spirits. The consequences of looking into burial caves or desecrating a burial was horrific. It was known that Hawaiians would restrain criminals and club them to death. If the war implement was not around, then they would find the biggest rock and bash your face in for what you saw. Hawaiians often took it a step further into the afterlife, placing the mutilated body on an altar, letting it decay and rot as an offering to appease the gods. And Hawaiian laws were so clear and so easy to understand. You knew if you were or were not a couple breaker. And you also know that the penalty for couple breaking was death. Great lengths were taken to conceal the burial site so that nobody would know, so that you wouldn't even be tempted to reveal the location of the burial. You yourself committed suicide. You know, looking at this binder, it just kind of shows me how persistent I was in protecting our burial cave. Although I was recognized as a descendant 
by the Hawaii Island Burial Council, the State Historic Preservation Department intervened. The developer then halted his project. He made me an offer of three months to come up with $50,000 to save the burial cave. I printed flyers and posted them around town asking the community and businesses for donations to raise the money. Aloha, hi, how are you doing? My name is Keone. So I'm trying to save a Hawaiian burial cave um, from being destroyed by development. And we have family ties to this burial cave. I needed to move quickly to stop the developer from moving forward with breaking ground on the burial cave property. So I researched online and I found a person whose name is Pali Kapu Deadman, and he was involved in protecting a mass burial ground in 1989 against the Ritz-Carlton Kapalua Hotel. It's been said that there are a lot of times that bones have been taken out in the past and up to a point there have been bones taken up here. And the thing is that we have watched it and at this time we can no longer stand it. As Hawaiians, we feel that our bones cannot be taken out anymore and we are not going to allow this to happen anymore. And it took this case, it took the finding of this many bones here, the, the, the disinterment of 870 bones, for us to come to that realization that we have to take a stand and stop this from happening here on Maui, on Hawaii, on Oahu, on Kauai, wherever it happens, we have to stop the state from giving permits to developers to take our bones out. We don't want them out and we want these bones here returned. We speak for thousands of years of Hawaiians before and thousands to come. Regardless of what the other nationalities may, may think, we as Hawaiians think this is sacrilegious. It's against our traditional beliefs and it has to stop. Pali, we're here at um, Honokahua and how, how do you remember this place? Do you remember? None of this was here when we were here protesting. It was just brand new ground being opened up with the barrels inside. But the dooms were there and it was like facing the beach. Let's go walk a little bit. Yeah, well, that wasn't here. There was a lot of things not here. Okay. Uh, this is an area that is not open for walking on unless you have permission from certain people do you have permission already from those people my ancestors i'm sorry sir um it's our job to ask that people don't walk on this area unless they've been given permission from the person who is the caretaker of this area and it's a family's job to come look at our family i understand that but i don't know who you are so. well i'm a hawaiian look just my job this is my job I'm over here, that's over there. That's your job. God, oh, the ignorant people, man. I mean, where, how far we've come from that time to now? You know, does she know that we were here stopping her from digging us up? She doesn't know that. She doesn't really know the real meaning of this. Why doesn't she know? Your cultural specialist who's in charge of culture it's not orientation to this lady about who we are and how we should be treated. That's not a specialist. It's a guy just a job opportunity, man. Mm -hmm. Because he's got a job, he's got brown skin, he got a brown skin name, he's an expert. I listened to Pali at Honokahua as he shared with me the burials he saw at the desecrated burial site. But it was very desecrating and bad feelings because you would see little pieces of tarps, and if you lift up the tarp, there was a skull, or there was some bones, and they were all over the place. So what the archeologist did was hire everybody he could, uh, amateur archeologist, part-time job, anybody that was in the field, or get done his job or his contract before we came. Um, there was so much EV that he couldn't do it. Okay, how many people he hired? I mean, they stopped at 1,200. How much was more left in there? So it was a major burial site. I feel our ancestors crying out. I cannot see the children being dug up like this. I cannot see our people, our ancestors being dug up like this. Pow! You can't, can you see your grandparents and your families being dug up? We don't go to your grave sites and dig up 
your families and take your jewelry and take all your possessions, all your private possessions out and put them in your museums to show the tourists. They took great lengths to make sure that the deceased didn't go barren. And barren meant without anything. If a warrior died at battle, then upon his death, his war gear would go with him. His finest malo would be buried with him, or he would be buried in his finest malo, his cape, his weapons, his gods. And so these items were of great mana to the person, not to anybody else. The news of the desecration spread throughout the Hawaiian Islands. Soon after, an overnight vigil was held at the state capital on the island of Oahu. I arrived early in the day. When I got there, there were less than 100 people. But each hour on the hour, more and more Hawaiians came. When work ended, hundreds of Hawaiians came. The drum beat every hour. We prayed every hour. And we prayed that the Okua would awaken in the hearts and minds of the legislature and understanding that the desecration had to stop. This event reached the hearts of many, Hawaiians old and young, to take his stand. At that time, the Hawaii state government had no formal process or Hawaiian burial laws when dealing with desecration. Hawaiian governor John Wahee had some decisions to make. But the problem was that they kept finding bodies. And you know, in a few days it's like 10, the next day it's like 20. And then, you know, we started heading up. And at some point, this whole thing became ridiculous. You, you can't, ha I mean, what do you do? You can't have that. You, you, and, and in the course of all of this, you know, discovering that this is a very important place. The governor walked across the street at 1130 and took us upstairs, six of us upstairs and started crying about how how the situation is but you know i understand his emotion we went through that emotion too you know so he was late and he's crying you know we did we did ours and it was emotional so i'm glad that he was a hawaiian governor at that time i don't know how any other governor would have reacted uh so i can at least say that he did the right thing and i get respect for him for that from one hawaiian to another hawaiian that he stopped it he said, you know, as of right now, it's over. But more important, it underscored the uh, need to deal with this issue in a kind of um, straightforward way. And so we passed this uh, legislation to create the burial councils, which were established to, uh, uh, you know, work with or with all the new development. I quit the Barrel Council uh, the first year they had one, they put me on it. And I quit because the guys who made the rules were just as bad without even have rules. Because they appoint people on these commissions that were very strong Christian Hawaiians and Christians dig up a lot of things and move them. So you weren't gonna get the respect from the Barrel Council with these kind of people that's having the say so. And two of them on the Barrow Council are non Hawaiians. I mean, what? Does any race call some foreign race to talk about their race's burials? But you could in Hawaii. And you know, the barrels we're talking about is not Western contact or the church is responsible. No, these were traditional before Western man came around. So there's a different treatment and a different respect for that. It was up to us to deepen ourselves, to dig out the Hawaiian-ness of what that was, to stop the development and protect them. It had to take the whole moral inside to come out. Doesn't archaeology contribute to the understanding of the Hawaiian culture, and wouldn't it be of benefit to open it up, study it, and continue our knowledge of these uh, people? I think something has to be said right off the bat. The issue here is a moral, ethical issue. 
And the fact is that these three men are foreigners in our land. They are guilty of desecration. They are guilty. They are guilty of disturbing the bones. Nathan Napokov, the State Historic Sites Division, saw photographs which were not made available to the public in Hilo showing these men, fraudulent, unqualified people, holding skulls, holding skulls of Hawaiians. Now, the problem with this is, if this had been done to a Christian graveyard, if this had been done to a Shinto graveyard, to a Buddhist graveyard, people would be outraged. And these people, we hope, will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law for criminal violations, never mind moral violations, ethical violations. But to me, that is the main issue. Archaeology is secondary in this case. We don't even have professionally trained people, archaeologists, trained ethnographers to go in there and say what this cave means. These three fraudulent people are telling us in Hawaii, this is what the cave means. And I say, who are you? Who the hell are you? You're nobody. I went to an outlook on one of the major Hawaiian islands. This showed me the outcome of where the United States government is heading with our beautiful islands. With all the development here, I can't imagine how many burials and historical sites were destroyed in the process to allow this to happen. So we're in the middle of Waikiki and Waikiki there's like a lot of development. You got hotels, you got shopping centers. You got stores, you got homes in this area, and they developed on all this area. This mound is actually from all the burials that they found in Waikiki, from all the development, from all the hotels and all the shopping centers. They decided to grab all these bones and then put them in one area. This is a United States practice. This is not a Hawaiian practice. It's an American practice that they do this. And, and the sick thing about it is a lot of our Hawaiian people are falling into that it's okay, it's not okay. And just because they make it beautiful on the outside, that's the sick thing about it. That's what makes it worse, actually. Is they making it look like it's okay and it's not. Putting up the signs, the tea leaves, the Hawaiian flags, but what they did <laughs> was wrong. Those people in there had, had a life. There was protocol when they put those bones in the ground by the families. And that's what this whole state is erasing, that there was a belief system. There was respect out of this place. It's so sad, you know. And then you put a flame on the top. That's not one Hawaiian practice. You know, this thing's supposed to be hidden away from the community. In old times, when a person died, it was an emotional thing. Sometimes women would beat their chests and scratch their faces. Men would gouge out their eyes, take out their niho, their teeth, and disfigure their body. This was an expression to show their deep pain and feelings of their loss to onlookers. If someone was greatly missed by the deceased loved one, a bone would be taken and sewn into a pillow so a loved one could be near them. Oftentimes, instead of bones, the palm of the hand would be cut off, dried in the sun, and taken to be saved. And if not the hand, the fingernails, teeth, or even hair of a person. Over the many years, I've been to numerous burial council and board meetings to protect our burial cave. Aloha no kako. My name is Keone Ke Aloha Alvarez. I am from the island of Hawaii. You know, when I was eight years old, my ohana has discovered a native Hawaiian burial cave in the forest near our home. So I set myself on a journey throughout Hawaii Island as well as our neighbor islands to learn what was the traditional burial practices of our native Hawaiian people. Today, the United States government has continually turned its back towards Hawaiians, and their mission is to devalue, destroy our Hawaiian culture, our cultural sites, and this includes our burial grounds. Over the years, I've seen so many families struggle to find a common ground with landowners and developers. At these burial council meetings, too often I hear how developers dig up my ancestors and push forward to continue with their projects. Apparently, the permit was approved without archaeological monitoring. 
upon further investigation, what I noticed was that the person was displaced completely in two large clumps, as if they were dug up in two subsequent scoops. So now you have the stockpile material that's holding, but you also have a spread to the right. Sometimes landowners and developers choose not to cooperate with the process and descendants are finding themselves locked out of their ancestral burial grounds or in lawsuits with developers. This project is gross SHPD negligence. This letter says, our records indicate that no archeological inventory survey has been conducted and that no archeological historic properties have been identified within the subject parcel or nearby. Okay, so then we did a little more digging. It turns out there is an AIS, three of which are located on the subject property. 2704 Historic Cemetery, 2705 Hawaii, 2706 Subsurface Cultural Deposit. This is more evidence of either the gross corruption or the gross negligence of SHPD. This is unacceptable. These burials did not have to be disturbed. But I'm on my way, you know why? Because the guys on my way, they don't the want to bring up how you think all these people came out here. Because people stay behind the computers and talk. They come out, they stand in front of the people who don't like seeing them stand. So cool way for us. This is our people, and to sit there and listen to people talk about them, they like everyday business so they can cash their checks. It's heaven. Go ahead, what's your question, please? Uh, my question concerns, you know, you blame it on the white man about on how uh, we came over and take your land. This is America, you know. Let I me mean, just say something to this call. This is not America, this is Polynesia. Our country was stolen. That's one of your problems. You're ignorant, woefully ignorant. But you, caller, need to learn about Hawaiian history and about where you are. You think you are in America. You are not in America. You are in a colony that is in Polynesia that was forcibly taken, just as, I might add, all of Eastern Europe was forcibly taken by the Soviet Union, which Americans think is a very, very bad place. The bad, bad Soviet Union. Well, the bad, bad United States of America took Puerto Rico, it took Alaska, it stole Indian land, it took Hawaii, it took Guam, it took Micronesia, Balao, and you had better learn that history because you are the recipient of an imperialist tradition. This is Iolani Palace, which means Hawk of Heaven. It was the royal residence of the Hawaiian dynasty. And on this palace grounds, some of the high ruling chiefs are also buried on this sacred land. In 1890, Hawaii's king Kalakaua left Honolulu for San Francisco, California. During his visit, he died there. Upon his return to the islands, Hawaiians number thousands to attend the funeral and to show their aloha to the royal family of their loss. His queen, Kapiolani, watched from the balcony of the palace as King Kalakaua's funeral procession made its way to the throne room to lie in state. And what room is this? This is a throne room. It was used as an informal reception room audience room. Wow. It was used for balls. It was also used as a place for our ali'i to lie in state prior to their funerals. Kawakawa lay in state here for about a week, whereas for most of that time it was just family and close friends attending his coffin. And then we, the community, only had two hours to come in and pay our respects one afternoon. One of Hawaii's saddest images is captured of Queen Kapiolani leaning over her husband's casket as she mourns her loss of her beloved king. I visited a place called the Hawaii State Archives. It's known to hold the largest Hawaiian collection of historical photographs, government records, and laws of Hawaii's history. I wanted to inquire if the Hawaiian government was concerned 
or had written laws to protect Hawaiian burials during the monarchy time period. Kenny was interested um, and he asked me if there were any laws on burials in Hawaii and uh, since I didn't know for sure, I had a researcher look for us and this is um, the laws of 1860. If any person not having legal right to do so shall willfully dig up, disinter, remove or convey away any human body from any burial place shall be punished by imprisonment at hard labor for not more than two years or by a fine not exceeding $1,000. $1,000 in 1860 was a lot of money. So obviously that this was a heinous crime and they had to make sure that they put enough of a fine and time imprisonment so that people would not do it. This was a statute that was passed in 1860 in the Hawaiian Kingdom by its legislature protecting burial sites, you know, whether in caves or in the ground, right? And it is a violation and a crime to dig up a grave and remove the bodies. Current understanding on the English common law and American common law, evie or bones, the body, is not considered property. But here in Hawaii, in 1860 as a country, they didn't follow that logic. They said, no, evie is property and it demands protection. And that was the basis of the sepulcher law. This law has protected Hawaiian burials during the rule of the Hawaiian Kingdom from desecration. I'm here at Mauna Ala. Uh, it is a very special place to our Hawaiian people. It's also known as the Royal Mausoleum. This is where King Kamehameha's dynasty is buried. As you see, we have King Kamehameha II, we have King Kamehameha III, IV, and V. And then also you have distant relatives like Queen Emma, we have Bernice Pawahi Bishop, and then later, as the monarchy uh, started to grow, then you have other monarchs who's also buried here. And we also have our queen, Queen Liliu Okalani, is also buried here. So a lot of times our Hawaiian people um, view this place as a sacred place. They come here, they bring flowers, they bring leis to pay homage to our ruling chiefs of Hawaii. And today I'm gonna to be doing that, of leaving my own uh, ho'okupu or my offering here. Located in the center of the royal cemetery is a crypt. I pay my respect to the royal family of Kalakaua's dynasty, protected and locked with an iron gate. One of Hawaii's famous royals lay in state here, Hawaii's last queen, Queen Liliu O Kalani. <laughs> Lilo i ka po he kui he kili e o la pa ka wila e ke ao e we kalani wo ke kai e lua i pele e o pa i pa i ka honua no na kupu na o hawa i ne a mama no. I am honored to be able to visit our royals and pay tribute to our beloved queen, Liliu O Kalani. What a woman. You talk about a warrior. What a woman. Her strength alone, her courage, her dignity. You know, and then after all those injustices and insults and the taking of her whole country, not a little part, not a couple acres, the whole country by the great military power of the United States. In 1993, on the 100th anniversary of the overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii, 
President Bill Clinton signed an apology resolution into law, acknowledging the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom by the United States of America. Too bad she didn't live for 193 years so she couldn't hear that apology. And I think if she heard that apology, you know what she'd say? You're 100 years too late. And where's the restitution of my government? and the dignity of my people. Her Evie still waiting for restitution. The fighting about this also includes the burials that are beneath the ceded lands. And of course, Hawaiians are buried everywhere and people don't know where they're buried because it's a different entity now, it's the West. And because of that, there's been tremendous conflict between Hawaiians and the state. Under my obligation, I had to follow my administrator's rules. And I did know of burials being stored in restroom closets, in cardboard boxes on the Big Island. I know of burials being stored in rusty containers on Kauai outdoors. Just because these remains are not identified with, you know, a, a headstone doesn't mean that they're, you know, they're not important to Native Hawaiians. So we got to do something. And I don't think that people, or maybe people think it's all okay. It's not okay, and it's never got fixed. So for those who say it's fixed, it's not. And I'm here to tell you that. And the development on this island especially is going rapid and digging up all the EVs as much as possible. So I would say that the thousands that was at Onakoa, we got thousands now, and it's 200 here, 300 there, 200 here, and it all comes up way past thousands. So numbers is not the point. It's just stop digging. And the legal notices are calling families to come forward now and to um, identify who they are because um, they have connections to the, 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 the land that's here. Some of the old maps show the location of, of some of these sites and, and uh, this is how we can, we can tell what's here. If we're lucky, we find them on the map. The families, Kuleana, where they built their homes and and uh, of course, in, in the old days, they buried their, their EV or the, right on the property itself. They want to come here and, and develop this land. And they have to come in here and prove that there are no EV on the land. So what they do is they go in and they put in a, a, a test dig like this. However, on this one here, the EV's gone. It wasn't like this when we were last here. This is criminal. But greed, of course, you know, uh, they can bend the laws with greed. When we first came here the first time, there weren't that many tapes uh, marking different areas. Um, as time has gone by this year, so you'll see striped, you'll see solid colored flagging. Some of them are tied on the trees above the site itself. Some of them are actually on the ground tied around rocks. This orange fencing here they use for the developers and the bulldozers to know where the buffer zones are. A lot of it is because they haven't, they haven't completed their research in this area. And this is really indicative of a lot of development here. It's the research and the important things that should be done before grubbing is done is not done until they've already gone in and destroyed. And then they come back in later and want to research and want to run studies on, you know, what was here. First experience I had was a case on uh, the Big Island uh, in the, the Kona side, the Hokulia. And it's, it's just interesting because it reaffirmed how important Native Hawaiian burials are. And the reason I say that is because when an archaeologist comes there and this, this person writes, archaeologists can't figure out whether it's human or bone, so he just threw it. And that, you know, made a huge impact on me, but also it became a significant part of our case. Is that how you treat what may be human remains? Um, so it was just, you know, things like that, that I started to understand that 
even when our ancestors are on their way to Po, they're still with us. Hawaiians had a strong belief that the funerary objects had mana, or power, which was placed with a burial called moipu. Moi means to lie, and pu is to lie with. Moipu. And today, we don't know. We don't know how the, the person who died took care of these objects. We don't know the chance of the prayers that he or she utilized in the care for of these objects. So who are we to possess them now? Who are we to say, this is from my kupuna. I deserve to have this. I don't. I don't deserve to have it. Because it wasn't mine. It wasn't given to me. I was not taught how to malama. I wasn't given that kuleana. Nobody. In the Hawaiian culture, kahuna were central to Hawaiian life. Without them, nothing moved forward. Kahunas were masters in many trades, but commonly known as priests for healing and foretelling the future. The kahuna ana na were feared by the Hawaiian people. Sometimes their method was to obtain personal items, to cast spells out on their victims, to cause harm and death to their enemies. Um, I, I do know of, of a very beautiful uh, implement, funerary items that were made distinctly to harass that spirit throughout his lifetime, you know? And it was buried with him, so he never forgets it. So it's not necessarily the best of intent. And so for those who wander around thinking that, oh, look, I found this old item, I would be very, very, very careful. Because when somebody goes, if, especially if it was a negative thing, if somebody goes through all that trouble to make something that heavy, to put into that grave, you are not, you're not going to be the one who wants to carry that burden. Today, caves and graves have been desecrated or looted by foreigners and sold on the black market. Museums and private collections have been involved in acquiring these objects. The items were taken from the cave back in 1905 and kept at the Bishop Museum until six years ago. The museum loaned them to the group Hui Malama, which then reburied them in the cave. Our membership is steadfast in that we will not recover the Moipu. We will not be an accomplice to theft. Federal prosecutors charged two Big Island merchants with stealing more than 150 repatriated Hawaiian artifacts from Kanupa Cave two years ago. I decided to visit Bishop Museum. It was founded in 1889 by Charles Reed Bishop in honor of his late wife, Princess Bernice Pawahi Bishop, the last descendant of the Kamehameha family. Today, Hawaiian Hall is the central part of the Bishop Museum. This room has three levels and holds the largest pre-contact Hawaiian artifacts collection in the world. I met with Bishop Museum's historian, DeSoto Brown, who shared with me what he studied about the artifacts and keys or statues displayed in Bishop Museum. Some of them have bone or shell, some of them have human hair attached to them, others do not. They are range in size from very tall to very small, some are very muscular, some are tall and skinny. The ki'i are just a one manifestation of a force that was much, much greater than just this one carved image. Mm -hmm. So this may have been a receptacle for that or a home where that deity could live and inhabit if you went through the ritual to call the deity to come and live there. Mm -hmm. But it didn't just come because you carved it. Mm -hmm. You had to go through a ritual to do it. Mm -hmm. Respect them, but don't mess around mm -hmm. if you don't know the protocols. Mm -hmm. and 
is it is possible that nobody today does know the proper protocols that were used originally for them. My stuff belongs in the Alemana, which we don't have. My stuff should belong with the rest of those images in the Bishi Museum, where it should be housed in the Alemana the way it was in the past. It didn't belong to decoration of your museum to show off. We're not dead yet. You still treat our stuff like toys. This image I created, again, it's, it's a 20, 20th century, 21st century. It's based upon Hinamoy. Hinamoy was considered the patron, patroness of death. See how, see how the Hawaiians were? They have an image of the discipline, of the practice that it takes, the sacrifice it's going to take for you to recognize the passing of a, of a person. But today, modern Hawaiians, they gotta have them. Yeah, we can study it, but we can know what it was like in our, for our kupuna. That's why the term hala. Ua hala, those times are pau. Those were left with our kupuna, and they should remain with our kupuna. Bishop Museum was in a court case battle which was entwined with NAGPRA, a federal law made to protect indigenous skeletal remains and funerary items to be displayed in museums. Hale Aloha was arrested for refusing to retrieve stolen funerary items to Bishop Museum. For this, we are put in prison and treated as though we were thieves, treated as though we were common criminals. It's an outrage. You know, for us, everything that we have is a living museum, including the artifacts and the burial caves. And so the people that are putting it, you know, trying to buy these things up and preserve it for a collection and so forth, what are they doing? As soon as they buy them, what they do? They store it in, in some closet. They can, quote, protect it from the elements or, quote, protect it from somebody, would-be thieves that might come in and steal this stuff when they, in fact, are the thieves themselves. You know, it's like, you know, the thief stealing from the thief. We're living people. We're not museum pieces. And our, our Evie should never be a museum piece, ever. You know, you have to always look at these situations and ask yourself, what is the lesson that the Kupuna want us to have, to learn from? And that lesson is that we may look in the mirror and see one Hawaiian, but it doesn't necessarily mean that in our na'au, that's how we feel because we have gotten so damn far off the trail, it's not funny. To the point where we would actually engage in a public discussion on whether the, the, the family of this chief buried in this cave had the right to bury him with these moipu, and that we today have the right to second guess them and take them away, put them in a museum to educate ourselves. The irony of educating ourselves about Heva and to me, that was the lesson in, in Kwai Hai. Hiuvai was an ancient tradition. Hawaiians believed would cleanse themselves off after the body was buried. At dawn, the limukala, olena, and the ki leaf were used to perform the purification ceremony. Kahuna would pray for those who helped in the burial, and they could return in good health to the village and their families. All who had taken part would bathe themselves in the ocean to conclude the ritual. People around the world donated to my cause, but the funds were not coming in quick enough to reach the developer's deadline. I left home and moved to the capital of Oahu. It's a small city. I went there for a job to help raise more money faster. I live in Central Town, where every inch of our paradise is paved over with development. Seeing this place, I at times lose myself and wonder, where am I? 
Where is my culture? Where is the native forests and trees I'm so used to? This is not Hawaii. Living here has been tough for me. It's been an experience placing me out of my comfort zone. Out of all places for affordable living, I moved to downtown Chinatown, Honolulu. I never thought I would be living here. This place is really different than what I'm used to. But I just try to stay positive, looking at things in a brighter light, which keeps me going. I received a letter in the mail from a realty company. It was shocking news to me. It mentions in this letter that the landowner of the Barrow Cave property recently passed away. I could not believe what I was reading. I'm happy to say now he is the owner of that burial cave today. You know, I just knew that was something that needed to be protected. And that's part of our kuleana or, or our responsibility as Hawaiian people to perpetuate that and continue that. After many years passed, I decided to follow up with the current Island Burial Council board members of my accomplishments. Uh, Kioni, you're here for? Mahalo Nui, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to be on the agenda. I just kind of wanted to give everybody an update. You know, it's been about 25 years in the fighting of to try and get our burial cave uh, protected and preserved. So today I own the whole entire cave. I don't consider myself as an owner. I'm a steward, always been. Um, so do you own the whole property the cave's on or just where the cave, the, the length of the cave? Uh, no, I own the whole thing. The whole thing, okay. Yeah. The, yeah. All so right, the boundaries, everything there. Yeah. So I own, okay. um, it's in three parcels right now. From the owner myself, I'm saying that I would like the whole property to be a buffer zone. I don't want anything to be built on there, any hale in Pretoria forever. It's very special that you are a descendant and the landowner. Your, what you're doing is exactly what needs to be done. But the beauty of it is that you don't have to pull teeth with some landowner who's you know from Aina A and everything and doesn't know left and right. You are, as an Ohana, making the decisions that are best for your Ibi Kukuna. Uh, Kioni, uh, mahalo for your testimony and I personally will support you in your effort. But then again, thank you so much for yep. your, your testimony. Mahalo nai, thank you. We move by that, so. Yeah. Um, it's refreshing to um, have a young person such as yourself undertaking this kuleana. Um, it's 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 refreshing. I love it. It's so good. Good feeling. Now Manao is my kai. You're setting a plate for our future generations to to succeed, and also an example for our, our young people to come forward and step up to this. But I just congratulate you. It's really awesome your work. Mahalo, nai. Mahalo. Thank you. Mahalo. 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 Yeah, Kioni has taught me a lot about the burial sites. You know, what it took, uh, the timing that it took, the, uh, the prep amount of preparation that the Hawaiians would go into a ceremonial, you know, burial site. And they were really um, respectful of their gods and they really wanted to protect the souls that come from these people. and. That's what makes it so interesting because it's not just one part of Hawaii. It was spread straight across Hawaii and you know, every island. For him to educate people and for him to, you know, teach me and educate me just makes us all like really uh, appreciate where we're from. Although I was successful in saving my burial cave, the desecration continues today. Hawaiian burials marked in known cemeteries have also been desecrated. This is Kwai Ha'o Church. It is the first Christian missionary church in Hawaii, built in 1842. 
This building represents a milestone in Hawaiian history when the Hawaiian chiefs adopted Christian beliefs and banished many old traditional Hawaiian beliefs. Surrounding the church is an old cemetery consisting of traditional and Christian burials which lay to rest. I visit a coral memorial which includes a large bell located in the middle of the cemetery. This memorial has a dark history. In 1940, Kauai Hao moved 140 skeletal remains to another cemetery for the purpose of building Likeke Hall, a recreational center for the church. Years passed and the reburial cemetery property was sold. The 140 burials were exhumed again from their graves, then all the remains were cremated all together. Their ashes were taken back to Kwai Hao Cemetery to be reburied here. You got baby, you got baby one, baby two, baby three, baby four. So you got a variety of men, women, and children that's buried here. And just looking on this list, you know, I see my family last name, Kaui, and um, I'm pretty sure in some way we're connected. And uh, we weren't notified that they were going to be moved and, and grouped up with the uh, rest of all these people that was buried at the cemetery. These are uh, graves of Native Hawaiians that had turned to be Christians, you know, and learned of their God, forsaking their own ancient gods, learned of their new gods, and this is what they do to them. And the graves that are being disturbed today at Kauai Ha'o are Native Hawaiians, okay, and these are families of the people who built that church. Right on the other side of the footprint of the new building, right on the other side. And these missionaries are there under the trees with their huge tombstones and at peace while our kupuna are in turmoil. In 2008, Kwai Ha'o Church was repeating its history of desecrating over 600 burials to build a recreational center for the church. Over 10 years have passed since this desecration and the burials have not been reburied. They have been stored in the basement of the church. But the church is just dragging their feet. I don't know if they're hoping we're gonna get tired and just, you know, say forget it, but I can't rest until they're resting in the basement of the church. So the first 69 kupuna that were taken out, see the bell tower up there? They're in the bottom of the bell tower. I joined a protest during Sunday morning service to put the bones back into the ground. We're here at Kauai Ha'o Church, you know, doing a peaceful protest. Over 600 burials are held at the bottom of the bell tower for over 10 years. We're just letting them know what they're doing is wrong. The bones need to be returned back into the cemetery from where they came from. And uh, the family, as well as the communities here, and we're just holding up signs and letting people and bringing awareness about what's going on. So this is the site of where they disinterred over 600 Ibu Kupuna and they actually went all the way down to the coral bedrock. So from what I understand, some of the graves were stacked like six high. So you know that's either a family or it's, mul it's a, it's a multi-burial because no more room. Got to stack them on top six high. That's, that's pretty deep. So they took them all out and um, they are in the basement of the church. But to think that this could ever happen here, the shadow of the Ali'i church, where they dug out. I mean, this is 
This is like a nightmare. It's like a living nightmare to me. And I don't come over here very often because it's so hard to look at and to feel. These kupuna belong to somebody. These kupuna are somebody's, they're somebody's children, they're somebody's sister, brother, mother, father, grandparent. What happened over here is so wrong. It is beyond words. So my goal is until these kupuna are resting again in the place that the church took them out of, I'm not going to rest. The headline on the front page of the newspaper showed a second desecration of Kuai Ha'o. Over 25 burial headstones were vandalized in the cemetery. It had to have taken a person or persons that were so determined to make a point of whatever that was, whatever the message is. I mean, the stones are all down. The church managed to put a few back up, but the ones they couldn't put back up are literally broken off of their stands. These stones are not moved easily. These stones have been in place, some of them since the um, late 1800s, early 1900s, over 100 years. But you can see the thickness of this foundation. That pohaku got away a couple of hundred pounds. And then you have a headstone that's really big and thick. Once again, why would anybody do this? Except to send a message either to the church or to the Hawaiian community. I don't know. I just don't know. On the island of Oahu, there is a United States cemetery called the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. It is high above Honolulu, which rests in the middle of a crater known today as Punchbowl. At this burial ground, thousands of United States veterans are located here. Today is uh, Memorial Day. A lot of families out here and they're visiting their loved ones and they're giving lays, they're giving flowers. Um, there's thousands of burials within this area. Um, marking each burial, there is um, small American flags and it's very patriotic for the United States government, so they're marking each grave. And it gives a good visual of how many burials are here on this site. This cemetery is federally protected and considered to be hallowed ground by the United States. Which means anyone caught desecrating or disturbing this site would go to a federal prison. Visiting this place I think to myself that Hawaiian battlefields and burial grounds should be treated and respected with the same rights of those United States soldiers. The American Army, military, and even the Air Force has used Hawaiian sacred places as their target practice. The island of Koalawe has been bombed for several decades by the United States Air Force which destroyed many burials and historical sites on the island. Sacred valleys of Mokapu on the island of Oahu and Pohakuloa on Hawaii Island have been used as an army military training. During their training, the use of trucks and tanks trampled over many burial grounds. Our highest peaks such as Mauna Kea and Haleakala are sacred places in Hawaii Ne. On these mountains, it holds the remains of the ancient Hawaiian ancestors. I never did uh, do this kind of march before. This is my first march. And it's basically protecting all rights of Hawaiians, whether it be about Hawaiian burial sites, sacred places, the Mauna. It's very important that everybody's coming together in unity, and it's awesome to see. And I'm happy to be here with everybody and supporting this. Hawaiians and Hawaiian royalty from across the islands unite as one and protest to protect the burials and sacredness of our mountains. You know, it's not Hawaii, Hawaiians reside in America, it's re America reside in our Hawaii name. This is our country and we will live and die free in our country. Aloha is ours. Aloha is not theirs, aloha is not foreign, aloha is ours. And with us, aloha is actually make. That's why aloha is make. Because how can we live aloha when they taking our aloha? This is our aina. 
My Ohana is resting in the ground. Please, keep them in peace. Desegration is not correct. Please, don't disturb them. Don't disturb their bones. And the state and the county allowed this to happen. So bad, they even destroyed our burial to put the house on. With all the land they have, 47 acres, why is it they allowed to be on a cemetery of our Ivi Kupuna, our ancestors' bones? I'm very uluhua, disgusting of our government allowing this to happen. Things that are really that stay buried should be left alone already. It's kapu. All the people out there, the different world, the different race, they all like come Hawaiian. And they all like come to this place and they all know this word. people with uh, this is the only place we have and this is where we we're going to be buried we don't go to Japan and dig up Hirohito or, or any of those uh, Americans in the in the Civil War you know when they're dead we don't go there and desecrate those people so there's no reason they should come here to Hawaii and uh, desecrate our our burial sites and no one has the right to move anybody because it wasn't their right then and it's not their right now today just because they want to put a building up you know the Hawaiians were here before the buildings ever came a lot of people that come to Hawaii for their own purposes disregarding the fact that there are people that already lived here before they did disregarding the fact that this is a native land and there are natives here. And the irony of it is we have people from all over the world living in Hawaii. And people who come from lands that demand the respect for the native that live there. And yet they don't show us any kind of respect at all. So if they don't show us respect, how are they going to respect our dead? Recently, a close family member passed away. It was my dad. The day of my dad's Hiuvai, or purification ceremony. It was a beautiful occasion to have my family together, sharing the memories of my dad and our heartfelt loss. He loved each and every one of us. You know, my dad was never ashamed of saying that, of how much he loved us, and he was proud of us. And today, I'm here to honor him and my, express myself of how I know I can express him. And the best way I can do that is Hawaiian. And that's the only way I can do that. The sky was clear and the ocean was blue. We picked a spot along the ocean shore to pour my dad's pella or ashes in the ocean. I wanted to express myself. So I wrote an oli or Hawaiian chant of my feelings for my dad. O naivi kapu kapu mau kupu na. O naivi kapu kapu mau kupu na kaui ka vekiu a o ma ke When I chanted for my dad that day, I did it deep from my puuvai, my heart. This was a very important thing for me and I wanted to say it in Hawaiian of what we were doing that day and how important my dad was to our family. 
mai ho ma ka po i na me a pa a po ele ele I wanted to incorporate our Hawaiian practice in our ceremony. You know, the ocean is just an extension of the land. And we, we sometimes forget that there are many burials within the ocean, you know, and we need to respect that. And that's what I wanted to do too, is honor not only my dad, but all the burials that's buried within the ocean at Pohoiki. And one of my oldest brothers, he really felt it and how he was just kind of being with my dad in the ocean and just letting everything and being in the moment. My other brother, Danny, he was the person who was in charge of pouring my dad out from the umeke into the ocean. And he started to pour my dad's ashes out into the ocean. And there was like a little wave that came and it kind of went into the bowl. So it kind of made the ashes, um, you know, with, with some kai, with some ocean. And the uh, umeke had a lot of my dad's ashes in it still, you know. He just poured a little bit out, but there was a lot that was still in the bowl. But he filled it with all the kai, and then he just raised the bowl up high in his arms, and then he just poured the ashes, like, on him. Man, I just seen that, like, you know. And I just knew, like, that's how much love my brother had for my dad. A lot of people, they, they might, say, you know, wow, you know, that was too much or whatever, but, you know, that was a very Hawaiian thing to do. You know, with the hiuvai, it's not only pouring my dad out and being in the kai with kane and, you know, the whole Hawaiian beliefs with all that, but with that, it comes mano, right? It comes with the shark, you know, and for me, I did a little, uh, a little koa, a fishing shrine, and and I forgot to tell my brothers like if you ever see something weird, whether it be a rainbow or a mano, a shark in the ocean, all that is just all signs of of our ohana. Yeah, I wanted to not only honor my dad but honor even my culture. And a lot of times, you know, it, it takes preparation, it takes protocol in order to do something sacred like this. If you look at the tree of life, we find the, the trunk, and then we find all these branches, and all these other branches that came off it, and all the little leaves, and these are all our family members. What's important here is the ivi kupuna. That is the root of that tree. So to allow desecration as it's being done rampantly in Hawaii, of those bones is literally an attack on the very foundation of your tree of life. You know, this is like soul tradition, you know? People don't get that. This is Hawaii. Before anybody came here, we had a people, a population of people who lived here thousands of years before anybody came here. And then they're gonna tell us how we got to treat our burials and that that's not sacred to us anymore and then twist our own people to think that way and then the the traditional practitioners who's really trying to uphold them making them look like the criminals making them look like the bad people it's so messed up what other people think of our ivy is irrelevant very irrelevant as long as we know what our evies mean to us that that's our kupuna that's our loved one one of one that we we respect it and we continue to respect in their demise this is the way we're taught what we should be talking about is what they left us and um and hunting down their graves is not a way of finding out what they left us. Let the dead pass, bury its dead. That's a killer. And I'm just saying, as one species, like every other species, I like stay who I am as long as I can. Because that was my purpose in this universe, like everybody say they get their purpose. Oh, mine is to stay Hawaiian 
as long as I can be one. And if it takes me standing up for it, then I gotta do it. And if it takes me to tell him I'm not a Hawaiian, he wrong, I'll tell him. And if you like me half step caring for an Hawaiian, I ain't gonna do that. I'll go 100% all the time. So that's what you scared dealing with. It's the 100% brother, not the 50, not the half, okay? I'm not half a glass, and that's what I think a lot of Hawaiians are. It's not their fault, but bruh, you know how fast you can turn on light up and down on a switch? Just turn your switch on, bruh. That's how fast it is. Just turn them on. You're in your own house and you don't know how to act. And you let other people run your house, especially the EV. I'm not talking about on stereo or my car. I'm talking about these moral things that every race respects the most is their ancestors. Outsiders don't realize what they're doing to our families. You know, and if that's something, you know, that they want to change, then they should go back to which where they came from. You know, if Hawaii is not suitable for them, then by all means, find someplace else that is suitable for them. Our life was beautiful, but because of all this change, our life now is difficult. I cannot be a Hawaiian in another country. I cannot be a Hawaiian in another state. I am Hawaiian because I am of Hawaii, because I am Hawaii. For the past 10 years, I've been making videos about my life, documenting the burial cave, learning from it, and trying to preserve the site. Now I took my one-man campaign online. Aloha no kako. My name is Kioni Kealoha Alvarez, and I live in the islands of Hawaii. The knowledge that I gained from my elders about burials has allowed me to share my story and to share our burial practices. Preservationists in Hawaii and in the United States learned about my one-man campaign online. This opportunity allowed me to be on TV shows, the radio, schools, and colleges to people who were interested in what I did and how I learned it. I even made it into National Geographic. And the power of the internet and getting the word out. Good for you, Keone. Today, I'm very happy of the accomplishments that I've done. Um, over the years, I preserved one burial site, and then I preserved another burial site. And just recently, I preserved a third. So I'm very happy preserving their burial sites and keeping it sacred. And this goes for the future generation. And uh, that's kind of what my legacy is, is to make sure and ensure that our ancestors are going to be protected forever. And this is how I want to see it for many generations after. A forest, pristine, a sacred place for our ancestors and for our people can come and visit. If I could share with anybody about burials and everything that I've learned, I would share with them, especially in Hawaii, is not to go into caves. And especially if they know it's burial caves. Everything that I do, my family does. You know, I've learned a lot about you know, traditional Hawaiian burials, I learned about our culture, and I passed that on to my own family. And meaning that when I come to our burial cave, I teach them how to malama, how to take care of this site. One thing that I make sure that my family know is to have that ike, or to have that respect. It's not about the objects that's in a burial cave that's important, but more so having that ike or having that respect is actually greater than having any of those possessions. You know, having those possessions doesn't make you any more Hawaiian. Um, and that's what I tell my family, is that you need to have respect for the sacred because our burials were meant to be kapu, were meant to be sacred and not to be seen by people. And that is part of culture. 
that is part of what tradition is. Looking back on this journey, I feel good about myself to be able to be the guardian of our burial cave ever since I was eight years old. Today is a special day. It's my hiuvai, or cleansing. To be able to move forward in my life now that the burial cave is safe under my protection and everything that I've learned came to a full circle. This kahea, or calling, is special. It is a gift that I'll continue to pass on to my ohana and the next generation. I have committed myself, like our people have done for over 2,000 years, protecting our Hawaiian burials, ensuring that our ancestors will remain hidden, sacred, and kapu in Hawaii. Oh, 